So I said I wasn't going to do this, but we're actually going to do a complete H bias transistor stage. We'll start right from the assumptions and go through it. And uh, this is something you can use over and over again. And we'll start with setting the current point in the amplifier. I'm going to pick two milliamps because uh, the more current that you run through these transistors, generally the more uh, bandwidth you can get out of them. So I'm just looking at a ham radio from uh, August 1968, and they've got an article called Converting Vacuum Tube Equipment to Solid State. This is interesting, and uh, this was a fad for a while. They were taking some of the old commercial and, uh, uh, you know, gear from the 50s and 60s that were used for uh, two-way radio and so on, and uh, even some ham equipment, and attempting to convert these older receivers and transmitters to solid state. So, boy, you better know about biasing if you're going to attempt this kind of stuff. And, uh, of course, the initial attempts were done with bipolar transistors, and then they discovered uh, depletion-type uh, FETs and uh, dual-gate MOSFETs and so on, and that became a very popular uh, pastime to solid state your boat anchor. So we're not going to be doing any of that stuff. But let's talk a little bit more about biasing. Um, the first thing we have to know is why do we bias? We bias in order to put the device into the linear region where we can amplify mostly AC signals. And RF signals and audio signals are AC signals. So uh, we like to put enough current into the stage to satisfy our design rules. So if we were designing something that was battery operated, for instance, we want to get the most performance out of the stage that we can but we don't want to use a lot of current doing it. So we would want to use a transistor that has a high FT if we're going to use an RF type circuit like in a handy talkie where we have battery power. We wouldn't try to use a 2N2222 for instance. That said, uh, with a 2N2222 you can get RF performance if you put some current through it. Um, I'm going to select 2 milliamps uh, for my experiments. Uh, because 2 milliamps in a 2N2222, 1 to 5 milliamp region, uh, is going to provide enough uh, gain that uh, we can operate up through the shortwave spectrum. Now, if that were a VHF or UHF transistor, that amount of current would get you up into the, uh, the high uh, UHF region, or maybe even into the gigahertz. So, those are some of the reasons that we have different types of biasing. Uh, if you look in the data sheet, you'll see that the 2N2222 is capable of 800 milliamps of, uh, of IC or a collector current. Now we're not using it like that, of course, that's mostly a switch type application. You put that kind of current through a 2N2222 for any amount of time and you're guaranteed to uh, burn it up. So you would need heat sinking and so on to, to go anywhere near that amount. Uh, it's been a fad to run high current in bipolar transistors in order to improve linearity and to improve high frequency performance. So you'll see the 2N2222 sometimes with 10, 15, 20, 25 milliamps of static current going through it. We're not doing that. We're using a tuned amplifier. So we're getting our gain in a narrow band form and we only need a fraction of a milliamp to really get the kind of gain we're talking about. So uh, that's what we're going to start with. Why do we bias and what level of bias do we want for our particular design? So I'm just looking at some classic magazines. Here's one from 1995, Radiocom Magazine. This is a UK standard for uh, ham magazines. And, uh, you know, you see a lot of, uh, of the early handy talkies that hams used. Of course, it all started with the commercial handy comms. And, uh, in the commercial world, they were using NICADs for police and fire radios. And these NICADs were typically 12-volt batteries. You could certainly design a handheld where every stage basically ran on 12 volts or a derivative of 12 volts. You could put regulators for the various stages in. And this makes for a very nice-looking schematic where everything has uh, kind of a parallel uh, shape to it, where each stage is getting a certain amount of voltage and it makes the uh, the schematic look very pretty. But something that the radio manufacturers of the handy talkies found was this was draining the batteries terribly. So they got to thinking, well these stages, many of them, are only amplifying microvolts or millivolts at most. 
why do we need to give them 12 or 10 volts to operate um, when they only need a fraction of a volt? So they began to do something. They began to stack stages. That is, send the same one or two or 500 microamps of current down through several stages at a time and then decouple the stages in a way that the RF and the audio and the mixers and the oscillators would not talk to each other. So this series style of bias, uh, while causing many problems with troubleshooters or people that like to look at schematics, it was a great way to save battery power. So that's yet another way that biasing became important uh, in the uh, late 60s. The famous HT220, one of the very first modern transceivers, was built in this way, in this stacked totem pole style design. And it did drive many troubleshooters and technicians completely bonkers when they saw the circuit for the first time. Next we want to set up the DC biasing so that the 2N2222 is operating in the linear region as a class A amplifier. The so-called H or voltage divider biasing is a very robust method to set what's called the Q point. The advantage of using a voltage divider lies in its stability. Since the voltage divider formed by R1 and R2 is lightly loaded, the base voltage VB can be easily calculated by using a simple voltage divider formula. Remember that the transistor must always be turned on to be a linear amplifier. This means generally that more than 0.7 volts of bias is required so that the base is above the emitter. The addition of an emitter res resistance helps control the transistor's base bias by introducing negative feedback, which negates any attempted changes in the collector current with an opposing change in the base bias voltage. And so the circuit tends to be stabilized at a fixed level. In other words, if VCC varies, uh, you'll see very little uh, effect in amplifier performance and gain. We'd like to see about one-tenth of VCC at the emitter, in most cases, for this uh, negative feedback. For a 9-volt supply, that's about 1 volt. The addition of this emitter, emitter resistor means that the transistor's emitter terminal is no longer grounded at 0 volts potential, but sits at a small potential above it, given by the Ohm's Law equation of uh, VE equals I over R, where IE is the actual emitter uh, current. The first things we're going to do, uh, uh, one of the first things we're going to do is select a DC supply voltage, or VCC, and a collector operating DC current. I'm going to select 2 milliamps for this example. Uh, generally, higher current means more bandwidth, so 2 milliamps would be better than, say, running 100 microamps. We have some data sheet information. Remember, our FDS, it looks like the HFE, or the current gain, at 1 milliamp is around 50, which is close to our operating point. And the saturation voltage from collector to emitter is 400 millivolts. 400 millivolts, we could probably use 300 millivolts. But I want to use a 9-volt battery, so I'm going to select 8.5 volts as my VCC. This gives me a little bit of design margin as the battery goes down. We need to calculate IB. How much base current will it take to turn the transistor on so the full 2 milliamps of current can flow in the collector? We know that our worst case HFE, sometimes called current gain or beta, is 50 for the 2N2222 alpha. So we simply divide the 2 milliamps by 50 and arrive at 40 microamps of base current. So also keep in mind that we will have to design a voltage divider with enough stiffness to provide this 40 microamps without loading. Next, we want to pick RE, the emitter resistor, to give us that 1 volt of bias. So I selected 470 ohms. So we know what VRE is, and we know what VSAT is. Now we can figure out VRL. Remember that we're using a transistor as a current amplifier. In effect, a variable resistance from 0 ohms to some value. We want the load resistor to be the same value. So now when the transistor has no signal, the load line is centered. When we're modulating that 2 milliamps up to 4 milliamps and when off to zero, uh, you'll see this on the load line diagram as a, a voltage going up and down. Next, we need to calculate how much DC base current we need to keep the transistor turned on. It's good practice to make our voltage divider 10 times stiffer than the required current for that base. So we select resistors to set up the proper divider with 400 or 500 microamps going down through. R1 is simply VCC, 
minus that required 1.64 volts to, to keep the circuit on, divided by the divider current. So it looks like almost 16K, but I'm going to use the more available 15K value. R2 is simply the 1.64 volts divided by what's left over, or 4100 ohms. I'll use the closest standard value on the low side, or 3.9K. So putting it all together, we have four very standard value resistors for our final circuit. In order to maximize gain, however, we're going to bypass the emitter resistor with a capacitor that has a reactance value at least 10 times lower than the emitter resistor value itself at the lowest frequency we're interested in. In other words, we preserve the DC negative feedback, but we're going to kill the AC negative feedback with this cap. This is going to maximize the AC gain. So I'd simply pick a 0 0.01 capacitor. The coupling capacitors are similarly set to have reactances that are about 10 times lower the input than the input resistance and output load resistances. A 0.01 cap, for instance, probably completely adequate in HF for stage-to-stage -stage coupling with the kind of impedances you see with bipolar stages. I tried a good quality 0.1 cap here too, both in and out, and saw no high frequency effects through the shortwave spectrum. But of course, putting these 0.1s in there, you might have some low frequency noise and interference below the broadcast band. We're not making an audio amplifier here. Okay, let's see how we did. We have the transistor and the approximate resistor values. The 1.8K is up in the collector. I see the 470K down here in the emitter, the 3.9K base to ground, and a 15K resistor uh, supplying the current to the base. Let's check our VCC first. 8.45, let's just bump it a touch. Eight point five, perfect. So first of all, let's see what our load line looks like. We'll look right on the collector. Four point five four. We would like to be half of eight point five, but really the transistor cannot switch all the way to ground because of the you know the voltage we have here on the emitter. So it's actually almost perfect. I don't think I'd change a thing with this. This is an excellent spot for bias. Let's look at the base. 1.70. It's a little higher than we predicted, but not bad. And the emitter. 1.041. Just a hair higher than we predicted. So, yeah, we've, we've done a good job biasing this stage. I wouldn't touch it. I'd leave it just with those values to start with. So, a real design engineer does not use... Uh, these simple formulas and rules of thumb when, when he's designing or when she is designing. Um, they use uh, more modern tools and simulators. But uh, I learned, you know, from, uh, from this book back in the 70s, it's uh, Design of Modern Transistor Circuits, Modern, uh, by Morris Eunuch. And uh, this kind of is a more of a technician style of learning to work with transistors and field effect transistors and so on. It takes you through the practical formulas and, uh, and it has many, many examples. So if you can get your hands on this book, it's a good thing. And uh, speaking of uh, field effect transistors and depletion type devices, they're much like vacuum tubes in that they require a negative bias to keep them off. So you will see that their load lines are controlled by negative volts. Um, if you were to operate them with zero volts or positive voltage like we do with bipolars, we actually have to turn transistors on, bipolar transistors on, to utilize them. Uh, the device would be completely on like a switch and you wouldn't be able to control it at all. Uh, the exception is the enhancement mode FET, which is a, a FET that can tolerate uh, positive control voltage as well as negative. So, uh, get, get your hands on uh, some some literature like this where it takes you through practical examples of bias. So this video on biasing was one that I really didn't want to do but I, I figured that we've been talking so much about
these circuits that we should at least do the simple H bias example. And this gets you started uh, for designing everything from audio amplifiers up through, you know, the VHF region. And uh, even the guys that are designing in the millimeter waves and uh, microwave region, the first thing they think about is, how do I stabilize the transistor? How do I get the bias right? 